So today I'll speak on a basic concept from the Bhagavad Gita, which is called the three moves. And <clears throat> I'd like this to be interactive. So anytime if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So basically, we in today's world have acquired a lot of knowledge. In fact, if we consider scientific knowledge, even of one field, just a fundamental particle within an atom, we have hundreds of books about that. So when we have so much scientific knowledge, what is the need for anything ancient or traditional or scriptural or spiritual? Basically, we could say that there are two distinct kinds of knowledge. There is a knowledge of matter and there is a knowledge of what matters. <laughs> <laughs> knowledge of matters. Okay, what is this made of? What is this? What is this? What is this? So science is the study of matter. And it's very important in its own way. There's no minimizing the importance of knowledge of matter. At the same time, knowledge of what matters, what is really important in life, what is it that we make the purpose of our life, what are the values that guide our life, that is the knowledge that we need the most. Say for example, you have come to this house now. Now in this house, if somebody is an architect or somebody is a home designer or whatever, you could spend an hour looking at the house itself. And it's, it's, it's one kind of knowledge. But if you have come here to learn something spiritual, then you would focus on the th three things. You know? uh, what is it that you have, your purpose? What have, why have you come here? Then what will help you get along the way? And what will get in your way? So for example, if you have come here, then is there enough space for me to sit? If I need a chair, if I need a backrest, is that there? Or if you know that maybe somebody who sits next to you, you have come for the talks before earlier, before and you know some person keeps uh, chatting between the class or maybe messing with their phones and then that distracts you also, then you may decide I don't want to sit next to this person. So when you come to a, when we come to a place, we are not particularly interested in the knowledge of matter. That it is the knowledge of what matters. Okay, why have I come here? And what is my purpose? And for getting that pur for pursuing that purpose, what will get me along the way and what will come in my way? So that is what is the what matters the most. And the ancient wisdom texts of the East, such as the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam, they focus on this. The knowledge of what matters. In fact, uh, a lot of knowledge of matter without the knowledge of what matters can just burden us. It's okay, this is like this, this is like this, this is like this, but what am I meant to do in my life? So when we talk about the knowledge of what matters, or somebody who is a sports fan, Maybe they're a basketball fan. They say, what matters is, okay, when the basketball match starts, nobody should interfere. Let me watch. Everything else, just forget it. Somebody who is a loving, responsible parent and they have a baby, the baby starts crying, just forget everything. This is what matters to me. Somebody who is a, say, a nationalist, they say, my country comes first. Most people tend to be eye specialists. Not eye specialists, but eye specialists. <laughs> so, what happens is, for all of us, based on where we are coming from, different things matter. So, what is it that matters the most? Is there a hierarchy in this? And is it that if somebody says, oh, sports matters to me, and somebody says, okay, my nation's security, my nation's prosperity matters to me. Some reason my children matter to me. Are all these equal? Or is there a hierarchy among these? 
If, if there is a hierarchy, what is there at the top of that hierarchy? So this is something which uh, we all resolve, but not always with conscious thought. We all, when we have to decide things, say for example today, you decided to come here for this talk. You could have decided maybe stay at home and maybe watch some TV. Or you could have gone to some friend's place. You could have done many other things. But in your hierarchy of values, you decided this is important. And that's why you came. So we all have certain values and a certain hierarchy of values. But often, these are not necessarily well thought out. And sometimes we just go by the moment. Okay, this is what I feel like doing, let me do it. And it may not be bad. Sometimes we need to be spontaneous also. But there are times when we need to be conscientious. When we need to think carefully and then decide. So then the knowledge of what matters is what is directed, what is told in the Bhagavad Gita. So the, for understanding this, the Bhagavad Gita talks about three modes of material nature. In Sanskrit, the word is guna. Now the, the, what is a mode? Basically, we all have consciousness. So we could consider that consciousness is like light as well as electricity. Here, if I draw this example. If, oh, okay, that's fine. I'll hold it. I'll just be a little soft. No, that's okay, bro. I'll, I'll hold it once I know it. So if this is the soul. Oh really? Yeah, I think so. I think it's so. <laughs> Let me complete this now, then we can do it. Thank you. So from here, we could say it's light, and also it's like electricity. Now, what's the difference between light and electricity in this context? Light is what helps us see things. So when consciousness flows outwards, there is perception. So you could say the soul is like a torch, a flashlight, and the beam of light that's flowing out from the soul is consciousness. So consciousness is the light of awareness. So right now you're looking at me, so you're conscious of me. So consciousness helps us to perceive things. And additionally, consciousness is also like electricity. Now electricity it does yeah, the, it, the charge, no. charge of course, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so electricity also does things. So electricity flows through a fan, the fan moves. Now we have cars, electricity it makes the car move. So basically we interact with the world in two ways. We take in information from the world and we do actions in the world. So if this we consider the soul, then this is the physical reality. Now, in between these two is our mind. So there is the soul, there is the mind and there is the physical reality. And each of our minds is different. And that's why the same physical reality we, we perceive it differently from how somebody else perceives it. So the, there are, so the broad ways in which the mind is influenced, the Bhagavad Gita calls those, those three broad patterns as the three modes of material nature. Three modes are basically three broad uh, psychological types, you could say, of how we perceive the world. So it's called in Sanskrit as Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, or goodness, passion and ignorance. What do I uh, mean by this? So you could say there are three kinds of people. Some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, and some people wonder what happened. <laughs> so, that means some people, they, they think and then they act. And they make things happen. Okay, I'll do this, you do this, you take care of this, and they make things happen. So, first there's reflection and then there's action. But for some people, First, there is action and then there is reflection. They do it. Hey, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to say that. And then what happens? 
they speak one word thoughtlessly and other person gets angry and then what could be a small disagreement which could be politely resolved it becomes like a world war so some people watch things happen and uh, they just they try to do one thing but a hundred other things set off by that and they, they get overwhelmed what's what's happening and a third category is they just lost in their own world mm. they wonder what happened they maybe just lost in net surfing lost in movie, movie binging or drinking they're not even aware of what is happening around the world so this is the three broad psychological types three broad ways in which when we interact with the world so when we are in goodness we will think and then act when we are in passion we will just be impulsive when we are in ignorance we are just passive of course sometimes people in ignorance also become destructive because when things don't work they just they become they are violently destructive but broadly it's just apathy passivity so we could put it another way do we have a wiper or something yeah. so people in ignorance they are often you could say crazy hmm? now crazy does not in the in, in, in a, like a insane. pathologically insane but it's just that they are disconnected with reality just lost in their head hmm? those who are in passion they are crazy in being busy so so yeah. they are crazy they are stuck in the mind so be, so this this mind should be a filtration right yeah. so if, if you're stuck in it that's then, then then that's it's a, it's a like, blockage yeah. it's a blockage should yeah you can just wipe it okay like you said i think maybe putting it here yes. is you want to move the mic then So those who are in ignorance, okay, this is they're crazy, and those who are in passion are. It's okay. It's no wet. Oh, it's wet. Okay, wet. okay. I'll wait for some time. That's that's okay, bro. That's okay. I can I can continue speaking and I'll write it down after. Okay, thank you. I thought the. Is this working? I just checked on it. It's working. Okay, fine. No problem. Let's wait for it to turn. Android. So now, if you consider the like, if, as a very good observation you made, there's there's consciousness, there's the mental reality, and there's the physical reality. So when the consciousness gets lost completely in the mind, and they get disconnected from the world, then at a physical level. they appear crazy they are not responding to physical reality at all normally when do we consider a person crazy say all of you now are sitting hearing this talk and every one of you is reasonably confident and the person next to you is not going to suddenly turn at you and slap you in the face <laughs> so basically you understand that everybody has come here for hearing a talk and then that is their good disposition so based on the physical reality we are in 
there is a certain way we expect someone to behave and if somebody behaves in a way completely inappropriate or disconnected with their physical reality that's what's wrong with you so that's what we consider as crazy so what happens when everything that we experience we often think of happiness and distress as being caused by certain events oh that person spoke angrily to me that spoke, person so spoke, spoke so rudely to me oh you know this happened i lost my job i got this terrible disease there is that so now it's true that there is a physical physical events do happen but actually our experience is not determined by the physical events alone our experience of pain or pleasure is not a one step process it's a two step process why two step the experience the event happens in the outer world the event is in experienced by the mind and the uh, or rather the event impinges on the mind and based on the conception in the mind we experience say for example somebody uh loves deserts would you have to like to share what is your favorite desert 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 okay favorite desert okay well does anyone have a favorite desert okay uh, no boston, not much boston cream cake boston cream cake that's very specific thank you <laughs> okay so now suppose you come for the program today and then you know there's a boston cream cake at the end of the program then you'd be eager for it and then the program gets over and the meal is being served and you find there's no cream cake over there <laughs> what happened so, so then maybe the cook say actually we're planning to make it but somehow it didn't work out the ingredient didn't come or it didn't come out well so we decided not to have it then you would feel disappointed you feel annoyed but suppose somebody else also likes boston cream cake but just they have been recently diagnosed with with uh, diabetes mm-hmm. and now they they you know oh, everybody will be eating this cake and i am not allowed to eat this cake and it will be torment and then the food is served and then they say there's no cake yeah we didn't have a cake thank god <laughs> <laughs> so now the event is the same there's no desert available for us but the experience depends on the context of the person it is of course it's a physical reality that they got diabetes but it's also the mental conception so so it's critical that events alone determine uh, what we experience it's events and the conception in the mind based on which we interpret those events that determines the experience this doesn't mean the event the physical reality is not important yes the physical reality is also a reality but it is not the sole reality so based on the kind of mode we are in we will experience physical reality differently so if there is a movie theater and people are watching a movie and suddenly somebody screams fire and you see some kind of uh, bright uh, red sphere somewhere now most people what will they do step on one another trying to yes, yes panic and run stampede and this often in crowded places when any mishap happens the casualties are not because of the mishap as because of the stampede <laughs> so the stamp in stampede what is happening that people act without thinking no they want to save the self yeah they want to save themselves on whatever circumstances are not important so if yeah. they step on somebody else yeah it's it's also that is important <laughs> yeah but sometimes what may happen is another like, step of the ladder <laughs> yeah it could be that yeah i agree with you and, but the thing is that you don't think much i want to save myself and whatever looks the easiest way to save myself it could be that 10 people could go from this door 10 from that door but if this door looks bigger let's all go out there But people have a herd mentality they follow one another exactly so this is the bad part that's true they don't think and plus in a in a, in a situation where it's uh, chaos all the motor uh, kind of activities don't work i mean uh, 
the person would not be able to use all his motor skills. It would be panic mode and pretty much would be just following the person in front of him. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's what happens. We're conditioned in such a way. Yeah. So, the example with the stampede and going back to the modes, is that ignorance? What's happening? Let me get out of here. Or is it passion? Let me okay. act now and I'll deal with the consequences later. Yeah, I'd say that uh, if somebody just rushes out, most likely that would be in passion. In ignorance, they would just get petrified. Petrified. Deer in the headlights. Deer in the headlights, yes, exactly. So we can say the fight or the flight response. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not always, sometimes both fight and flight can be in passion. And in the ignorance, it just freeze. Freeze. Just don't do anything. So basically, in ignorance, one just is crazy. In passion, one is crazy in being busy. That means just working so much, acting. One, two, three, four, five, six. And okay, why am I doing this? Is this really important for me? Is this really productive for me? It's we, as you said, we run like a the herd mentality. Whatever it is that everybody else is achieving, I want to achieve it and I want to achieve it better than them. So it's like many people live in a rat race. Now the world is competitive and we all have to survive in the competitive world. But in the rat race, there are two problems. First is that even if you win the race, you still remain a rat. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you shake, and you make yourself look good. Yeah. So essentially, no matter how, what target you achieve, what level we achieve, it's the same grind again after that. And from this hierarchy to that hierarchy, but still the competition is still there. Mm -hmm. So our our conception of life, if it doesn't change, we still stay in the rat race. And why is it crazy in being busy? I just want to get ahead of others. Which is okay, we all, there's a struggle for existence. And we need, we, we need to tap all the advantages that we have in this struggle. But if we define ourselves solely in terms of others, that is a way to keep ourselves forever miserable because you don't have any identity yeah we don't have any any intrinsic self-worth any identity we all want to be happy and we could say to be happy is possible but when we are in passion we want to be happier than others <laughs> and that is impossible to be happier than others is impossible Again, for two reasons. One is because we often overestimate how happy others are. <laughs> Especially if somebody is in, a, uh, in the mental health care kind of sphere, and you can easily come to know, uh, as a spiritual teacher, people often share their hearts with me. So I you come to know how deceptive appearances are. Some people might look very handsome, beautiful, successful, wealthy. And we might be walking on a road and we might see somebody going in a Mercedes or a Porsche or some Porsche car and we think, think oh, this person is so happy. And in that car, they will be thinking, the next cliff, should I just go off the cliff and drive off and end my life? So we overestimate how happy people are. And that's why being happier than others is an impossible task. And another reason is that even if we move up a hierarchy, the world is such that there will always be somewhere, someone above us in the hierarchy. And that's why, okay, I'm happier than the others. Okay, I'm wealthier than everybody else in my immediate family. Oh, but there are people in my extended family who are wealthier than me. I want to become wealthier than them. Then I want to become wealthier than everyone else in my community. So you're, you're crazy busy without achieving anything again. Yes, without achieving anything which brings fulfillment to, to us. Yourself. To ourselves, yes. So that is the way most people are. So you say, when Shri Prabhupada came to America, he said, it's okay. Uh, most people are in either passion or ignorance. So what happens, being crazy and being busy, 
after some time it just becomes exhausting and when it becomes exhausting we need a break and for that break what do we do just do something crazy and one way we can see this craziness is through the obsession with entertainment entertainment has always been a part of human society as long as we know about human history entertainment has been there but today the mania associated with entertainment is unbelievable yes if say a thousand years down the line some archaeologists wanted to study the 21st century and they wanted to know what is the distinctive artifact of the 21st century <laughs> one artifact is would be movies you know they're so expensive so the millions billions of dollars is spent on it and there's so many are made more than the magnificent architecture or more than many scientific inventions dams or whatever else it's movies so now if millions and billions of dollars are being spent on making movies who is paying for it it's ultimately we the consumers so now if somebody is paying so much for entertainment then what does it mean it means that it's they feel they need it so much that whatever be the price i'm ready to pay pay for it so it is it means living in passion eventually becomes so exhausting that i have to get away from this somehow or the other that's why much of the entertainment today is called escapist entertainment is escape from reality turn on some movie and forget the reality of your life or turn on and start playing some video games and it's understandable some people become frustrated because life is difficult and it's difficult for everyone but nowadays among young people you know it's they don't even want to face life They're like young college students and stuff like that they just spend their whole day playing video games and surfing on the net and just getting caught among men it's more of video games among women it's more of socializing on uh, females it's more on social media it's both it's not such a gender division but the idea is that we, even before we start facing life and its difficulties he's running away from is it. escaping from it running from it yeah and he's taking drugs in his free time exactly so he can still stay away from it yeah which is really horrible because it's a, it's an epidemic of of of, of this of this era yes so It doesn't solve anything. It just hurts. Yeah. It just makes things worse. So now, this is so. In when we live in passion, it becomes exhausting, and the escape way takes us in ignorance. So we are crazy in being busy, and then now the things that we try to do that either they don't happen, or they happen, but we realize that they don't bring happiness. and then he said thinking why do i spend so much time doing this nothing works in life life stinks and then just sink into ignorance now there is there is a better way to live this is busy without being crazy so in the mode of goodness we think we analyze we decide what is really important for us what matters for us and then we pursue it in a focused and balanced way so what do i mean by this see all of us want to grow whether it is financially whether it is socially intellectually we all want to grow and growth is a normal human condition all of us were unicellular organisms at one time in our mother's womb but now we have millions of cells which make us so we have grown so growth is natural however cancer is also growth hmm. but that growth is destructive and it's destructive because it is disproportionate one set of one set of cells in the body start growing so much that 
they lead to uh, the dysfunction of other cells in the body. So growth is balanced. That means, okay, a person's hands grow, leg grows, every part of the body grows. But if one sort of cells are growing, that's disproportionate, that's destructive. So in passion, we are busy and we may grow. But it's only one part that grows. A person might be phenomenal at their work and they succeed. And professionally, they are great. But their relationships are crumbling. And then they are suspicious of everyone and they alienate their loved ones and they may have a big house but the big house it only provides them the privilege of a lot of space in which to feel lonely. <laughs> so so cre when we are in passion we grow but it is unidimensional growth. It's like cancerous growth. We grow and we think I have become successful. And some people in our social circle may admire us also. Oh, you are so successful. <coughs> but internally, it's hollow. Because there is no real meaning, no real fulfillment. Because we are not really dwelt on what matters for us. And in the mode of, if we are in the mode of passion, this is how our perception is. We just keep moving like a, in a herd mentality. In the mode of goodness, there is a little clarity of perception. It's before I act, I think, what is really important for me? And it requires a significant amount of firmness to not just get pulled, do this, do this, do this. Okay, no, what is important for me? Let me understand this and then do it. So the Bhagavad Gita tells us that to understand what is important, we need to begin inside out, not outside in. Outside in means the world determines this is important, do this, this is important, do this, this is important, do this. Now inside out means look at yourself, understand yourself. Understand what is truly important for you. And of course if we live in the world, some things that are considered important in the world, we also have to do those. But don't let the world define you. You define your role and then act accordingly in the world. And then a person in goodness is also busy. They also work. They also work hard. But they work purposefully. And when they work purposefully, then such work brings fulfillment. For all of us, we all want pleasure. We all want happiness. But it's not just happiness that we want. We want meaningful happiness. How many of you like humor? <laughs> you know, nobody would say that I don't like humor. <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> but suppose somebody t told you from tomorrow onward, you, know, you have no financial obligations, no professional obligations, no family obligations. From morning to even night, just sit in front of TV and watch comedy shows. How many of us think that's enjoyable? Maybe for half an hour, maybe for an hour. Maybe for a few hours if we are really bored with life. Uh, we would be laughing, but it is meaningless. Because you are watching, you're not taking action. You're just yeah. standing, watching other people do everything. I mean, it's exactly. not. Yeah. There's no fun in that. There's no fun in that. We, we want to get our teeth into something. We want to do something tangible. Yeah. So we want happiness, but what we want is meaningful happiness. And conversely, normally, biologically speaking, we all have this tendency for pain avoidance. None of us want pain. But it is not just that we don't want pain. It is what we don't want is meaningless pain. Mm -hmm. Which you cause to yourself. Yeah, meaningless pain is, say, if you're walking on the road and suddenly some nail pierces our foot. We'll get irritated. We'll curse the person who put the nail over there. Maybe in today's world, we'll sue the person. <laughs> 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 so, but... Say, if we suspect that we have got tetanus or some other infectious disease, we may go to a doctor and the doctor might give us injection in the same place. And there we would pay the doctor for that dose. And the sensation is the same. But in this case, we accept the pain because it is meaningful. Because, okay, this pain will save me from some greater pain. So if we think of ourselves simply as, I want pleasure and I want to avoid pain. 
that's not actually the that's not what really matters for us yes certainly we want pleasure and we don't want pain but what we want more than pleasure and what we want more than avoiding pain is meaningful life and if for a meaningful life even if we have to give up some pleasure we're ready to give, do that okay stop watching comedy do something in place and do that and for a meaningful life even if we want to uh, if we need to accept some pain we can accept it so that brings us to the question then what makes life meaningful broadly speaking there are two things it is connection and contribution if we look at our own life what are the most meaningful thing times in our life it is when we connected with somebody in a way we felt understood we were able to help them we just felt connected so connection is one thing that brings meaning in our life and contribution what contribution okay. yes contribution we have been given certain talents certain abilities certain resources and with this can we make a difference in the world i mean the world is very big can we make a difference in the life of one person so the times when we were able to make a difference in somebody's life that's the time when we feel oh that was meaningful so basically in the mode of goodness we are busy without being crazy in the sense that we are busy on the things that matter i started by saying that this one i started by saying that scripture is the study of what matters whereas science is the study of matter now through the study of matter we can get a lot of things to do you know i can i can fly i can drive by car i can fly by planes we might even in the future get into space travel get go on we can, we can have a lot of things to do if we are in passion and science can also provide us a lot of ways to escape if we are in the world of ignorance but science itself doesn't tell us what matters so now transportation is good entertainment can also be good but if it it is meaningful for us but what gives meaning that is some a different genre of knowledge and what the bhagavad gita tells us is that we are at our essence spiritual beings and ultimately i talk about the three level of reality physical mental spiritual so we need spiritual connections and we want to make spiritual contributions and that brings us to transcendence that you wanted to say something yes i i wanted to ask a question uh so the difference uh that separates goodness from passion they both have action and yes them. definitely They're just the, the goodness is just a selfless action that brings satisfaction basically versus a passion is a selfish action that brings distraction and emptiness so basically the goodness is the is a starting point towards transcendence you're just taking them one step at a time right that's beautiful very articulate thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah so so in passion the action promises pleasure but it gives trouble mm-hmm. or it gives at least dissatisfaction disappointment so krishna says in the bhagavad gita in 1838 that that which tastes like nectar in the beginning will taste like poison in the end so many things which we do because of pleasure they end up giving us trouble in fact the search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness like you mentioned drugs when somebody takes drugs they're searching for some pleasure some relief but that gets them into so much trouble after search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness on the other hand in the in the mode of goodness krishna says in the gita that that pleasure is that which tastes like poison in the beginning but tastes like nectar in the end why poison in the beginning because we have to we have to resist the pushes of the world come on do this buy this watch this do that and we have to resist the pulls or pushes of our mind also and we have to be our own person do what is important for us so in goodness itself so goodness is much better than passion or ignorance because we are focusing on connections we are focusing on contribution although goodness is good it is not good enough 
because we might not necessarily perceive spirituality very clearly. It's the beginning of spiritual perception. So we might have, uh, we might have good family connections, and that's good. It's uh, it's not so easy to have even those family connections nowadays. But we have good family connections. We are good friends. We are doing something uh, meaningful. But there is no spiritual dimension in our life. We don't really know about the soul. So transcendence means that we understand that I am a soul, and the soul is a part of the whole. The soul is a part of God. And we all can, as with respect to doing contributions, you know, we all can make some contribution. But if we connect with God, if we connect with in the Bhagavad Gita, God is known by the name Krishna. He's all the one, all attractive one. The infinite, he's the infinite being. So it is that our, we are finite consciousness, God is infinite consciousness. And we are like tiny light. And we can create some light around us in the world by our contributions. But if we develop a connection with the infinite consciousness, then we become a channel for the divine to work through us. Then each one of us can do much more than what we thought was our capacity. Because it is not just the light of our finite consciousness that we are sharing, but it is our finite consciousness is becoming a channel for the infinite to manifest. So, at the level of transcendence, we focus on gaining meaning both ways. Developing a connection with the divine. And then making a contribution on behalf of the divine. So, making a connection with the divine is one of the primary limbs of Bhakti Yoga. Primary aspects. So, we have mantra chanting, we have association of spiritually minded people, we have worship of the deities, we call it the ABC association, books, books like Bhagavad Gita C is chanting, and D is deity worship, and die. we take a spiritually offered food, so which we have soon. So, this is <laughs> <laughs> so by all these we establish a connection, we establish a connection with God, and then that connection stabilizes us. That connection strengthens us. The world will still be in the mode of passion. Our mind may still be in the mode of passion and ignorance. The pushings will come. So the world's ups and downs and the mind's ups and downs, they are like waves. The waves will keep coming. And now, I'll conclude with one example and then we can have some further questions. That when waves come in the ocean, it's very difficult to fight against the waves. Just get swept away. So similarly, we have moods. Our moods come upon us. And life situations also come upon us and they create certain moods in us. And then, it's very difficult to resist them. But, although it's difficult to resist them, we don't have to be swept away by them. We need to direct our energy constructively. So instead of trying to fight the way Say, I'm feeling angry and I say, I won't feel angry, I won't feel angry, I won't feel angry. It doesn't work like that. But instead, when the wave is coming, we need an anchor that we can hold on to. The wave will come and hit us, but if you are holding on to the anchor, then the wave will hit us, but the wave won't hurl us away. So the same force, if we try to use to fight against the wave, we will be swept away. But that same force, we use to hold on to the anchor then there's a better chance that we won't get swept away. So our connection with Krishna is like the anchor. So we need to find out among the bhakti activities. See, there are two circles. The circle of things that are good for us and the circle of things that we like. Now, if these two were identical, life would be wonderful. <laughs> but unfortunately, they are not identical. But nor are they completely disjoint. There is some overlap. So the overlap of where things we like to do and the things that are good for us. If you find that overlap, then that those activities can become like an anchor for us. Say, if I like music, and there can be many, many different kinds of music. There can be violent music also. And there can be spiritually soothing, uplifting music. So if I like music, then I take the music that is good for me and it is spiritual centered on spiritual sound vibration. 
and then keep that accessible to myself. So that when I get, when the waves of life hit me, the waves of the moods hit me, I can have that access, I hold on to it. If I find that for me, uh, I'm more intellectual and I like philosophy, then if there are some good quotes which I have read, some good points which I have heard, note them down, keep them readily accessible. When the mind gets agitated, just read them. Then that will be our anchor. So each one of us, there is a standard process for connecting with Krishna. But that connection may, may sometimes be challenged when the waves come. So we need our own anchor that we can hold on to. And then when we hold on to that anchor, we find that we are stronger than what we thought. We are stronger than what we thought. And then with that connection, stronger in what sense? Stronger that we can resist the world's blows without getting blown away, without getting crushed. And then we can make a better contribution in the world. The contribution that we all want to make, all of us want to feel that we can make a difference. But that's, as I said, for meaning, the connection is important. Because, but the contribution also is important. And whatever it is that we are doing in our lives, if we are connected with Krishna, we'll be able to do it better. Because we won't be so much tossed by the world's ups and downs. We will stay more focused. And at an external level, it appears sometimes that trying to connect with Krishna, it takes time. You know, time to meditate, time to come for the spiritual association, time to read books. Yes, it does take time. But it saves the time that is lost because of our getting buffeted by the world's ups and downs. If we invest time in connecting with Krishna, then say, next time somebody, somebody disrespects, this is us. So we are going for a get together, a party, and we greet someone, and that person snubs us. Now, maybe for the next one hour, our mind is filled with revenge fantasies. <laughs> next time, you know, in front of a hundred people, I'll snub that person. And then we are in the party, but we are not in the party at all. But if we are more spiritually grounded, okay, this person disrespected me, dissed me. Maybe they are going through something, I don't know. Maybe they didn't even notice me. Or maybe they were upset with me, I'll find out. Okay. You won't get that disturbed by it. Okay, it happens in But um, you know, in, the, in this sense, you know, in Bhagavad Gita, it talks about um, you know, the qualities of Brahmins, right? So obviously something like forgiveness, simplicity, generosity, peacefulness, that's the, exactly. that's the uh, you know, attributes of the Brahman, Brahmana of a person good in some way. But we have, but, uh, again, you know, in the same respect, if that uh, person was in a... In, uh, in a battlefield like Ocean, and I said, oh, okay, don't worry, it's okay, let, let them do whatever, you know, that, that would be a contradiction in terms of action as well, wouldn't it? So the, the relevant qualities are necessary in the relevant situation. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's right. So there are times when, okay, let's put it this way, very yeah. good question, there is a difference between weakness and wickedness. Mm-hmm. See, weakness is all of us have anger, lust, greed, because of which we do some wrong things. And then afterward, we regret it. So we have intelligence and we have conscience. These are generally normally meant to protect us from our impulses. So our last anger, greed, our intelligence rationally guides us. Our conscience, you could say, emotionally, makes us feel bad. I don't do this. So weakness means temporarily we are overpowered. But afterward, we may apologize, we may try to make some amends. And weakness can and should be forgiven. But in some people, there is not weakness but wickedness. Wickedness means their conscience has practically become dead. Because they have repeatedly neglected it. It's become dead. So to do bad and not feel bad is bestially bad. It's like a beast. So, so And their intelligence is used not to control their impulse but to cover up their impulse. They do wrong and then they do it in such a way that nobody will catch them. Now weakness deserves forgiveness. But to give forgiveness to wickedness is foolishness. So the point I'm making is, now it's not so easy in real life to determine who is, where there's weakness and where there's wickedness. 
the the point I have responding to your question that there are times when we just if somebody disses us we just okay forgive it. But Arjuna in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, he had forgiven so many times, and the other person was becoming more and more aggressive. Oh, the opponents Duryodhana and others they had tried to poison them, they tried to burn them alive, they had defrauded them of all their property, they had tried to dishonor their wife. And even after that, they were not ready to reconcile. The Pandavas said that, just you know, give us our half of the kingdom, you live the half of the kingdom. He said, nothing doing. He said, okay, just give us five villages. And then he said, I will not give you enough land even to put the tip of a needle through. How? So he was completely wicked and not desiring any reconciliation at all. There are different ways of saying no. Say A, you invite someone for a program like this. And they say, actually, I got this to do, I got that to do. I can't come. I would like to, but I can't come. You say, okay. But if somebody says, even if I die, my corpse will never come for your program. <laughs> <laughs> that is not just a no to the request. That is a, like a banging no in the face of a person. So Duryodhana's no was like that. I will not give you enough land to put the tip of a needle through us. So with that wickedness, if Arjuna had been forgiveness, then what would he have done? See, if he was wicked enough to dishonor a respectable lady in public, and if he got unchallenged power, then he's going to hurt everybody underneath. Everybody else. So, so in some situations, strong action is required. In the same you know, the, the, what you said, he, he disrobed uh, a, a woman of, of high standing in, in uh, Hong Kong. But at, at that time, there was many people who could have stopped that as well, including Bhishma, including yeah, that's true. Um, you know many of um, uh, the that's world. True, yeah. Why didn't they do anything? Why, were, why, why did they you know, just sit there and do nothing? Okay. They like to watch TV, probably. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll answer this briefly, but then later on we can talk about this in more detail because I think how many of you are familiar with what we are discussing? Okay, this is in the Mahab it's, we are discussing from the Mahabharata. So I think we will talk about it personally later. But I'll just mention it, yeah. Actually uh, the whole event that happened over there was so bizarre, so are so crazy that you know, n nobody had a compass of how to respond to it. Yeah, so obviously it was unconscionable, it was unacceptable and they should have stopped it. But at that time they were caught by the bizarre nature of what happened and they are also culpable, all those who remained silent, they were also culpable. So it's like a crime is happening, the doers of the crime are culpable and the witnesses of the crime, they don't do anything to stop it, they are also culpable. Yes, everybody was comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. I have noticed that human nature all through history like to watch people's misery. They like to they, they like to congregate and watch somebody being hurt. Go back to the Romans. When when all the Roman people used to sit around at the Colosseum and watching those lions come devour human beings. And, and, you know, and another episode where you have people who fight for their lives over there, you know, and they call them gladiators, mm -hmm. and they are killing one another, and that was a pleasure for people to watch. Fast forward many hundreds of years in the future, if you see a car accident and you see all other cars, they just slow down just to watch. You know, there is, there is some bad nature in us that we have to work against. So we don't be just watching other people's misery, but taking action towards stopping it at a certain point. There's also, I'm, I'm not saying there's, there's not the other uh, part of the human soul that likes to you know, give a hand and help people and, and pick up somebody who has fallen or do some good stuff, but there's also this other wicked side. And that was my, my question, where do that wickedness come? I just wanted so. to say that I let him finish the presentation because of the limited time we have. And then at the end, we can do the discussion. Sure, yeah. In a way, like, you know, the flow was, you know, 
all of a sudden we we like um, you know we're going in different directions. Yeah. So let him let him finish the presentation, then we can do the questions. I thank you for your comments. I mean, I'm happy to receive the comments. What we have to do, thank you for this moderation also. Because what happens? Uh, some comments are directly related with the theme. Some comments may be somewhat unrelated. And then we have a comment which is unrelated to the, which is related to the comment, which is not really related to the topic. Then we just go off. <coughs> so we'll, we'll address this. But I agree with you that there is a part of the knowledge which has, which loves to be a spectator to the spectacular. Even if they're spectacular, it's ghastly. So, so, I was talking about this, that if there's a connection internally with Krishna, and there's a contribution for Krishna. So, what we see is, we all have certain abilities. Some of us may have more, some of us may have less. But, if we use whatever abilities we have to make a contribution, Take responsibility for ourselves. If this is what I have been given. What can I do the best with it? And the mood over here is what we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. What we are, we have certain abilities, certain strengths, certain resources. But we use them. We hone ourselves so that we can use them better and we make a contribution. And when we do it in this way, connection with Krishna internally and a contribution for Krishna externally, then our life gains a deep meaning. In fact, it gains enduring meaning. Because we will not stay forever in the world. Even if we fare well in life, we will have to say farewell to life. <laughs> At one time or the other. But our connection with Krishna, our connection with the Divine is something which will stay with us forever. <coughs> Beyond this life. We will evolve spiritually and we will attain Krishna eventually. So, that understanding that we can act in the world in a way which is meaningful in this world and meaningful beyond this world also. That understanding is very empowering. And that understanding can encourage and strengthen us even if we are going through difficulties. Even if we ourselves are a part of the difficulty. But we take a positive responsibility for ourselves and move on. So this, you could say, in transcendence, how does this all work out? So we are crazy and busy for Krishna. <laughs> so we are crazy in the sense that we make sure that we stay connected. And some people may say, why are you so fanatical? See, a devotee, uh, those who are devoted to Krishna, Bhakti Yoga practitioners are not fanatical, they are fanatically focused. Mm -hmm. To achieve anything constructive in life, we need focus. And sometimes the focus has to be seriously focused. So as far as maintaining our connection with Krishna, we are crazy. In the sense that we make sure that the activities, that we hold on to our anchor no matter what happens. So in that sense, we are crazy for Krishna. But we are also busy for Krishna. <coughs> because we want to make a contribution. And when we work in this way, we will find that whatever be the situation we are in, now we may not be able to, if the world is a dark place, we cannot light the whole world. But we can light our corner of the world. We can light our own heart. And our heart can be a part by which we can light our corner of the world. So every one of us and every action of ours can have significance. Then we become spiritually connected. When we make our spiritual connection and we strive to make a spiritual contribution. That is the way we can live meaningfully. I'll summarize what I spoke. <coughs> and then we can have a few questions and comments. So I spoke on this theme of how to live a meaningful life based on the concept of the three modes in the Bhagavad Gita. So, we have scientific knowledge in the world and science is the study of matter. And the Bhagavad Gita and spiritual texts are what? The study of what matters. What matters. So, when we come in a room, we are not so much interested in the structure of the room. We are interested in that aspect of the structure of the room which furthers our purpose. So, knowledge of what matters means, what is my purpose? 
uh, what will get me along the way to the purpose and what will come in the way of purpose. So then, now what is our purpose uh, and what are the values we have that is affected by the moods? So we talked about the three levels of reality, physical, mental and spiritual. So the soul is both a light source, soul is a beam of light and soul is also like electrical energy. It's giving out the soul's consciousness rather. So we perceive the world and we act in the world. Now between the world and us, the perception and the action, they are filtered by the mind where the modes are present. And we talked about the three modes which shape our perception. Modes are subtle forces which shape the interaction between consciousness and matter. They shape the way we perceive the world and we act in the world. So I talked about three kinds of people. Some people make things happen. Some people watch things happen. And some people wonder, wonder what happens. <laughs> wonder what happens. So I put it another way that so people in ignorance are just crazy. That means the, the soul, the mind and the body, they just lost in their head. And they don't respond rationally to physical events. So they are crazy. Then most people are busy in being crazy. Or are crazy in being busy. That means that they just start doing one thing, second thing, third thing. They don't really think meaningfully what, what is important for me. And then they, they get loaded with things and then they feel, feel overwhelmed. So, and when they feel overwhelmed, they escape, it is just becoming crazy. That's why escapist entertainment is so obsessive for people. Uh, the artifact of the 21st century, uh, which could be symptomatic of people's lives today is movies. So many millions of dollars spent on just escaping from the world. So most of the world is in passion and ignorance. Then we talk about goodness. Goodness is where we understand what is of value and then we act. That's why we are busy but without being crazy. Why, how can we do that? Because the growth, we want growth but it's proportional growth. In the mode of passion and ignorance, it's like cancerous growth in the body. It's destructive for other parts of the body and destructive for the body itself eventually. Whereas in, the, in goodness, it's healthy, holistic growth. So when now what is it that brings happiness? So we discussed about how we want not just happiness, but we want meaningful happiness. And we can even take a pain if it is meaningful. So in passion and ignorance, we just think, we are chasing whatever we believe will make us happy. But in goodness, we introspect and think, what is it that really matters? What will bring meaning and meaningful happiness in my life? I will talk about two things that bring meaningful happiness. What is that? Connections and contributions. So in goodness, we focus on connecting with people and using our abilities constructively. But goodness is good but not good enough. Because we need a spiritual connection. Even, even if we fare well in life, we will have to say farewell to life. It's temporary. So beyond goodness is transcendence. When we understand our spiritual connection with the whole, with Krishna, then that connection we establish by the practice of the bhakti and that connection stabilizes us. When, when storms come from the world or storms come from the mind, then our connection with Krishna can be our anchor that steadies us. And then when we try to contribute, make a contribution for Krishna, on behalf of Krishna, then it is not just our tiny energy with which we are trying to act. But it is not just our tiny consciousness with this light, rather it is the infinite consciousness, the infinite light and infinite energy for which we become a channel. And then we can make far greater contributions. So for us, the way to a meaningful life is to establish a connection with Krishna and then to strive to make a contribution for Krishna. And this way, not only will we have a meaningful life in this life, but the connection with Krishna will endure beyond this life. And we will have a meaningful journey beyond us. Thank you very much. Hare. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I was, oh yes. so I was thinking maybe for 15 minutes or so we'll do questions and then have some kirtan. I know you have to yeah. be somewhere else. So if anybody didn't ask anything you want to ask, you can 
Yes, please. What is the difference between bhakti yoga and happy yoga? Okay. Is there much of a difference? Okay, what is the difference between Bhakti Yoga and Hatha Yoga? Both are Yogas. Yoga essentially means connection. So it is to connect at one level our essence with our essence, our core. We are parts of the whole to connect our essence with the whole. That is the ultimate purpose of all Yoga. Now, in Hatha Yoga, especially Hatha Yoga as it is practiced today, it has become more about uh, physical well-being and physical attractiveness rather than anything spiritual. Mm -hmm. It can be a pathway to higher journey, but Hatha Yoga is considered to be the preliminary steps in the process of Yoga. Yoga has eight steps. Mm -hmm. Yam, Yam, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyahara, Dhyan, Dharan, Dharan, Samadhi. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mo what most of us consider as Yoga is primarily Asan, one limb of Yoga. So Hatha Yoga is more the physical dimension of Yoga. Now physical well-being is conducive for spiritual focus and spiritual well-being. So it is good. But it is, Hatha Yoga as practiced today doesn't go much beyond the physical. Now Bhakti Yoga, Bhakti means love, divine love, love for the divine. Or bhakti Yoga is about offering the heart to the divine. So we make the connection through the heart. Now it is not, when we say the heart, it's not just sentimentality. What it means is, where our heart is, our whole being goes over there. So the, where the heart goes, our head also goes over there, our hands also go over there. So Bhakti Yoga is by, it's about channeling the deepest force within us, love. We all ultimately long to love and be loved. Somebody wants to be wealthy, famous, powerful. It's all because they hope that through the wealth, the fame, the power, I will become more lovable in the world's eyes. People, somebody will love me more. So love is what we long for. So that deepest force within us, the force of love, we direct for connecting with the divine. So most processes of yoga, uh, you could say that they focus on first uh, silencing your emotions, pacifying the mind, which is important. Yoga chitta vritti nirodha. The Patanjali Yoga Sutra says that yoga means to stop the oscillations of consciousness. Yes, that is true. So if we have a negative axis and a positive axis. So negative axis is where our mind is subjected to the world storms and keeps getting oscillating. Pleasure, pain, honor, dishonor. Like that. Then just calm it down. So from negative you come to zero. But then there is a positive axis. Where there are positive spiritual emotions. And Bhakti Yoga is about using the power of emotion to go from the negative axis to the positive axis. Whereas in other yogas, first what we do is just get the, uh, go away from the negative, come to zero. And then we discover about the positive reality. And then we activate the positive emotions. So Hatha Yoga will also ultimately lead to Bhakti Yoga. But Bhakti Yoga does in one step what otherwise would require two steps. So in Hatha Yoga, first, all the negative emotions pacify them and then start activating the positive. In Bhakti Yoga, both are done together. Okay? Okay. Yes. Um, I have a question when it comes to like a more spiritual like um, content to do with, has to do with the modes. So if someone wants to learn more about Krishna or partake more in Krishna consciousness, but you're not sure if it's like, would that be considered like, like you want to give up everything in a sense and partake more in spiritual life? Is that considered in a mode of fashion? Would that, how would that be? Because you're acting now, but you're not fully on the, you know, you're new. You're not mm -hmm. fully like, is that decision that you're making passion? Is it, um, you know, okay. I'm not sure. Good question. Say somebody is in the world, but they want to practice Krishna consciousness and maybe they think they should just give up everything and practice. Would that be passion? At one level, connecting with Krishna for any reason is good. At another level, we want to connect with Krishna in a way that we can connect sustainably. We don't just want to be like a meteor which goes up and then crashes down. We want to connect with Krishna in a sustainable way. So for that, it is important for us to 
acknowledge our physical and mental side of. So the body has particular needs, the mind has particular needs, and we need to accommodate them while pursuing our spiritual journey. See, uh, we don't work for our body, but we don't work against our bodies. Work for our body means any desire that comes up, I pander to that. I feel like eating, I eat. I feel like doing this, I do that. It's working for the body. And working against the body is, you know, we just torture ourselves with austerity. I feel hungry, I'll starve myself. Hmm? No, both extremes are unhealthy. The idea is, we work with the body. That means the body is a tool which I have. And I have to use this tool in a way that, that the tool works the best for me. Like if I have a car, then I have to understand, okay, this car works best on these roads. This kind of car works like this better. It doesn't work like that. It works best at this speed, not at this speed, whatever. So we have to acknowledge our physical reality, as well as acknowledge also mental reality. And then we practice bhakti in a way that is harmonious with that. So there is the monastic way of living where somebody disconnects from the world and focuses wholly on spirituality. But even in the monastic way of living also, there is a connection with the world because we want to make a contribution in the world. And that is for that is for some people, but most people traditionally also have been as a part of the world. As they say, we in the world, but not of the world. We our location is the, in the world, but our motivations are not determined by the world. So if we are new, the best thing to do is focus on developing your connection with Krishna. And then as that connection with Krishna becomes stronger, then how we can contribute in the world, that will gradually become clearer. If you put the second first, that means, okay, how much will I engage with the world? That is a difficult question to decide. So we don't know. We, we ourselves, see we, we don't know ourselves so well also. Because we are complex beings. How our mind reacts to things, how uh, we experience different things, we don't know that. So better take small steady steps to increase your connection with Krishna. And then Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam Dinamama Payantite. He says, I will give you the intelligence to take the decisions by which you can grow to you. So no need to worry too much about whether whether a particular action is in passion or ignorance or goodness. Focus on whether it is helping you to grow spiritually in a way that is sustainable. And then uh, do that. Does that answer your question? Or your question is something else? <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, it does. That's well, that's a half-hearted acknowledgement. Okay, sure. Right. Go ahead. Um, maybe this gets to what you were asking about. Um, between goodness, which means you know, connection within the world, service within the world, and then transcendence, which means connection with spirit, service, or pleasure of spirit. How can one living in the world uh, who's not able to take monastic life um, kind of balance those two modes of goodness and transcendence? Okay. So how do we balance goodness and transcendence, maintain the connections in the world and also a connection with Krishna beyond the world? Yeah, usually uh, this becomes a problem when we, uh, have, we come with certain conceptions of what a connection with Krishna means. See, Krishna is not just a God who is existing up there. The world is contained in Krishna. Everybody in the world is also a part of Krishna. So, you could say one way of going to Krishna is to turn away from the world and go to Krishna. Another way of going to Krishna is to go through the world to Krishna. Because we see the world also comes from Krishna. In fact, one of the messages of the Bhagavad Gita is to make your work into worship. That's Vakarmanatma Bhircha. Let's see your work also as a way of worshipping the divine. Now, what this means is that there are three different connections over here. There is our connection with Krishna, there is our connection with others, and their connection with Krishna. Hmm? 
So we have, you could say, horizontal connection with people around us. Then we have vertical connection with Krishna. And they have a vertical connection with Krishna. So most often, the problems come not just because we have a vertical connection with Krishna, but because we want others also to have that vertical connection. And we almost force them to that direction. So if we don't do that, that means we have our priorities clear. First priority is, I want to maintain this vertical connection with Krishna. Second is, I also want to maintain my horizontal connections. And as far as their connection with Krishna is, everybody is a soul, everybody has been given free will. So the mood of the Bhagavad Gita is, is of accommodating people where they are. Yeah. About two weeks ago, I was in North Carolina, so I gave a class. And the, mood of, the mood of the Bhagavad Gita is, from your place, at your pace, access God's grace. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> from your place, at your pace. So what happens sometimes, when we are practicing something, we feel this is wonderful. So let others who are connected with also practice it. And then we start telling them, do this, don't do this. So about 25 years ago, when I was introduced to spirituality, I asked one of our leaders, how do I preach to my parents? He told me, by letting anyone except you preach to them. <laughs> <laughs> because when, when, when we try to share Krishna, the dynamics of our relationships come into the picture. And then they see Krishna through the filter of their relationship with us. So in the, maybe I was in India, born and brought up in India. It's a traditional hierarchical society. So you know, it is not proper for a son to teach a father or a mother. So that's what I did. I got out of my way, out of the parents' way. I introduced them to people of their age who were also practicing spirituality. And in their social circle, they grew at their pace. So usually the horizontal relationships and the vertical relationship, they, we feel there is a conflict when we try to force others to develop their vertical relationship. Now we just explain, this is what I do. And, and when, even when we are presenting spirituality, we could present it in different ways. I call it three ways of presentation as prescriptive, normative and descriptive. Prescriptive is you do this and don't do this. For example, if we stop eating meat, and we tell all our family members, all of you should stop eating meat. Yeah, but why are you telling me that? <laughs> so prescriptive doesn't work. Normative is also, this is right, this is wrong. That also seems like lecturing. We put ourselves on a higher moral pedestal. Hmm? That doesn't make sense. Descriptive is, this is what I do, and this is why I do it. And if I say that, you know, I, I came to know about how much violence is there against animals, and how much pain they go through, I didn't want to be a part of the pain. Now, oh, they might, they might also say, I also don't want to cause such pain. And then they might take it up, they may not. So what happens is, if our practices don't come off as a threat to them, if we don't intrude in their space, they also usually won't intrude in our space. So we can maintain, a, some renegotiation will be required, because there are certain activities which we don't do as a part of our bhakti practices. And if they are doing it, then we will have to renegotiate. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the whole relationship has to be renegotiated. It's if we if we connect with Krishna and we maintain our connection with Him. See, ideally, what should happen is our connection with Krishna should improve our connection with Him at a human level. When Shri Prabhupada was asked, "How do we know a devotee of Krishna? How do we know your followers who are devotees of Krishna?" Prabhupada said that. They are perfect gentlemen and ladies. He didn't say that, oh, they wake up in the morning and they do meditation or they read this book or they do that. Said, what does the world care for what meditation you do? What does the world care for what books you read? He said, with respect to outreach, don't tell me what you believe. Show me how you behave. So if, say, I mean our horizontal connections, if our family members, if our colleagues, our relatives, they feel that our bhakti practices have made us a better human being. You know, I become a better, if they feel that your bhakti practice made you a better mother, a better, a better spouse, a better uh, colleague, they say, what is this? What makes you tick? And then they will become interested. So generally, if we keep our, we don't 
force them to practice what we are doing. And we don't judge them for what they are not doing or what they are doing. You know, we, yes, yes, I don't necessarily agree with what you are doing. But I accept it. I respect it. We don't tell this. Sometimes what happens is when we become spiritual, we, we already started practicing spirituality, we start disconnecting with people at a human level. And we start trying to connect with them only at a spiritual level. So I am a soul, you are a soul. And so I remember some students, I used to do college outreach in India quite extensively. So some students become very enthusiastic. And there's one, one boy who went back to his home and he was staying in a hostel. And then he went back after six months and in between he had been introduced to Bhakti. And his mother was so happy, mother cooked so nice food for him and he says, Hey, don't show me all this love. You know, I've had many mothers in many, many lifetimes. I'm a soul, I've gone through many lifetimes. His mother was shocked, what are you talking about? <laughs> she just didn't even know where he's coming from. The soul goes on many lifetimes. And in every lifetime we have relationships. But he is not acting like a human being at all over there. So that's why we alienate people. So if we continue our horizontal relationship and try to establish a better human connection, hmm, they see that okay, you have become more tolerant, you have become less short tempered, you know, you have become mm, your temperament has improved, whatever. They see that and they will become attracted. Does it answer your question? Okay. Any any other last question? Does it address your question or not yet? Yes, my question is addressed. Okay. So let me comment about the two things you mentioned. About the Mahabharata, I'll talk personally with you, but about this spectator syndrome. That's a... Um, there are, you, you ask, you know, what is it within us which just makes us passively watch when something bad is happening rather than do something good about it? So, this is a whole big subject, but I'll make some broad outlines about it. That how many of you believe that people are innate, people are innately good, or people are innately bad? Anybody thinks all people are basically good? Yeah. Basically good. Anybody believes people are basically bad? I believe really people are neutral, basically, because they are, you know, the self. You grow up from a self. You're born. You know, as a kid, you want to grab the you know something which is sweet, put it in your mouth. You know, you basically you learn how to share, but that's basically how you act. It's neutral, basically. It's just neutral, the, yeah. The self, basically. Yeah, it's the self. I agree with you. Let's let's explore that. But now most of you are not ready to agree that people are people are basically bad. But would you say that some people are basically bad? They should. They should be. Some people. We all have experience of evil. Yeah. Now evil means what? Evil is basically when somebody causes suffering for the sake of causing suffering. See, in the, as I said earlier, sometimes suffering is unavoidable. Say if you are walking on a crowded road and then we step on somebody's foot. That's unavoidable. That's, that's just, it's a, and then if you notice it, we might apologize for it. But imagine somebody says that their foot is there and deliberately they stand on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> cause suffering for the sake of causing suffering. That's evil. And we all have encountered people like that. In fact, especially people who, if, if we do not have a worldview that can accommodate, accommodate evil, it can be very disorienting. When somebody, say, comes back from some uh, war zone, post-traumatic stress disorder or something like that, what has happened is they've encountered evil. They've seen somebody who is out to kill them. And they do barbaric things. So there is definitely something within us which makes us make by us, I mean not you and me specifically, but generically as humanity, there's something which makes people do terrible things. So is something genetically wrong with these people who, who act in evil ways? Yeah, I'll come to that point. But what I'm answering the question is that, see, the Bhagavad Gita talks about two levels of innateness. And internally, like even with respect to children. Uh, if, if a parent has two, three children, parents, each child is different. 
Uh, some children, they, when they cry, they cry so loudly that they'll bring the whole house down, it seems. <laughs> some children, they are in the crib, and in the crib, they are thinking, when will I take over the house? <laughs> so, each child is different. So, when you talk about innateness, there are two levels of innateness. Within us, there's the mind and there's the soul. So, at the level of the soul, everybody is good. Because the soul is a part of God. So everybody at the level of the soul is good. The soul has an innate potential for virtue. But the soul is covered by the mind. And the mind has many impressions within it. And the impressions within a mind are formed by the actions that we do. Like you talked about drugs. Whenever a person takes a drug, then we feel high by that. And there is some external result of it. But every action also has an internal result. The internal result is that if we do an action, say if we do an action that causes an impression in the mind. And that impression gives a proposition to do that action again. So each first time somebody takes a drug, then next time let's take once again. And then over a period of time that proposition becomes so strong that it becomes it becomes compulsive, they become addicts. So basically, we all have certain impressions within us. And some impressions are formed by our upbringing in this life, by our association, but there are impressions which we carry from the past also. So, now, at the level of soul, everyone is good, but everybody carries different impressions in their mind. And again, you could put the impressions in the mind, which we carry from a previous life, within goodness, passion and ignorance. So people who are in ignorance, who have impressions in their mind from the past, from ignorance, they may act in terrible ways. And like I talked about wickedness earlier, some people just don't seem to have a conscience. Their soul is buried so deep under impressions, it's almost as if they don't have a soul. They are like a ghost of a person rather than a person. And some people, the impressions in the mind are very good. So they are virtues, they are good. So that's why overall everyone has a potential for virtue. But based on the impressions within the mind, everyone has propensities for different things. And some people have a propensity to help others. Some people have a propensity to just be passive. Some people may even have a propensity to hurt others. So these different propensities are there within the mind. It's ignorance, right? Yeah. Okay. It's not just ignorance, you could say it's malevolence. It's in ignorance, but it's worse than ignorance, you could say. So you fix that by worship? You fix yeah, that by fixed by basically by, I would say worship is important, but worship is not just one isolated activity of connecting with God. Worship is also uh, in the world by slowly doing the right thing. So, yes, I have a tendency to be apathetic. Just whatever is happening. But let me take one small step. I may not want to go and help someone. But if somebody is helping, let me try to do something to assist them. So, if somebody is in ignorance, they can't immediately jump to goodness. But they can take one step forward. And this is where association plays a very powerful role. In the impressions which we... There are many impressions we carry from the past. Which we can't change so easily. They are already there. There are impressions which we have got from our upbringing also. We can't change them. But what we can change is our association. And we are very socially responsive creatures. So our desires are not just linear. They are also triangular. Linear means we see a particular thing and we desire to do it. That's linear. Hmm? But triangular means that it is we see what others are doing and then we do it. Say, does any of you know what is a baklava? Oh yeah. Baklava? Oh, you know? Okay, thank you. When I, about a few years ago, first time I went to Australia, I never heard of a baklava. So I went to uh, a devotee's house and they, they said, for dessert we have got baklava. Would you like to have? Now, I had never heard of it and the name baklava is not very sweet. 
Baklava. Okay. So I said, maybe later. Hmm? Then there was another friend with me who had also come for, uh, for that lunch. And he said, yeah, give me. And then he took the baklava and he was closing his eyes and savoring it <laughs> in ecstasy. I saw him and I said, give me one also. <laughs> <laughs> so just seeing or hearing the baklava didn't create the desire. So there was no linear desire. But seeing somebody eating the baklava, that triangular desire came. So, for, so what happens is, based on the kind of impressions we have, we will have linear desires for certain things and we won't have linear desires for certain things. So somebody who is habituated to living in ignorance, they may not have any inclination, a desire to read spiritual books or do anything spiritual. But if somehow they come in the association of somebody who is spiritual, and they say, this is a nice person and you do this. So, now many of you may not have had any particular interest in Indian culture or Indian spirituality. Or you may have. But you may have Shastra Bhav and you like it. And then he is doing something. So it was that triangular desire that came up. So usually we cannot change our desires, that linear desires directly. But if somehow we can associate with good people, then by the triangular force of our desires, our desires will change. So somebody who is in the ignorance, is somehow they can develop some liking for somebody who is in goodness or in transcendence. And that also means that those who are in goodness and in transcendence, they should not be judgmental towards those ignorance. They need to be kind, considerate, compassionate. Then they will be like, and then that triangularity of desires can be used to transform us and transform others. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna.